Yeah, this, this goes to James. Um, I, I was happy then about the last slide because this helped me for the question. I wanted to, not that I had attended, but I want to remember something. I, I know you don't find it silly. It's almost 20 years ago you, when we were under Simon Bolivar's uh, notion of uh, if nature does not obey us, we will force her to do so. Could you please, perhaps on the basis of what you said on your last slide, do you also imagine a kind of uh, new um, relationship, so to say, of transhumanist thought to nature as not as something sacred, but something much more complex than older stuff things? And if this is the case, how do, would you relate it on your political spectrum? Hold on. How, where, how, where would you assign it in your political spectrum? Hold on, let's take a question from Townsend as well. Okay. This is for James as well. This is in regards to Thomas Sowell had two constrained visions of man. On one side, he said there's a constrained vision whereby man is not perfect and is not perfectible. And on the other side, we had the unconstrained vision where man is perfectible and can be improved and as a project can be perfected. And the two implications from these visions were, on the one side, free market capitalism for the constrained vision of human nature, and the other side, socialism and primarily communism of the unconstrained vision, that is the perfect man. So the thought I've had is, with transhumanist technologies, we are now veering onto the side potentially, I don't want to say perfecting, but absolutely changing human nature, so to speak, augmenting it in ways that we've not been able to do. So what is the implication of that those changes of being able to, to modify human nature in regards to those two constrained visions and therefore the wider economic organization of, of society. Yeah, the, um, in terms of the nature question, um, I think there's a general definitional problem that we've had for a long time is how much do we want to include in transhumanism? What is a, a transhumanist vision? The most narrow uh, the definition that I have is just about the issues of human enhancement of the body, the brain reproduction. But if you include space exploration and artificial intelligence and everything else, then it's a broader set of issues. But as I mentioned with the ecological issue, I do think there are philosophically cognate questions around people's objection to intervening, taking a direct interventionist and managerial approach to the ecosystem, which I think we should, um, and having the same kind of approach to the body. I think those are very uh, related issues. And um, so I do think that that is the kind of dominant trans, what should be or will, will emerge as the dominant transhumanist ethos if, if we get that far. Um, but you know, I think there are other ways to, to imagine it. One of the most extreme versions of that would be to kind of have eco, um, eco sensors on everything in the environment, the kind of David Pierce re-engineering uh, animals so that there's no more predation and that animals don't suffer anymore. And so there are very many variations that we could take this in. I've been very interested in the uplift debate. You know, um, do we have an, uh, an obligation to uplift certain kinds of animals, like animals who are in captivity, um, or is that in a form of imperialism, human imperialism over the animal kingdom. Um, in terms of the uh, moral enhancement, which I, I think you're kind of referring to the moral enhancement, human improvability in that respect, um, one of the things I've got often said to people about the idea of post-scarcity is that the only way we're going to have post-scarcity is if we change human beings, not if we make more stuff. Because the more stuff we have, we're just going to want more stuff. Uh, that's the nature of being a human being. Um, but if we started to change people, change our brains, make us want and I'm not advocating this, but I'm saying that's the only way that we would actually have a post-scarcity society. But um, yes, I do think that that, um, I, I mean, I, I think that you could be a capitalist and believe in human modifiability as well. But um, I do think that there is a, a point there that when Francis Fukuyama um, said that we were at the end of history, he was also implying that we had given up utopian visions about radical transformation of the human condition, and obviously the trans... And then, and then 10 years later, he wrote transhumanism is the most dangerous idea in the world. And the reason he wrote that was because he realized, oh, there are still people who want to radically transform the human condition, and um, maybe this isn't the end of history. And, and he wasn't even done then. But uh, so I do think that uh, moral enhancement is probably the, the most challenging of the issues that we are to address. Because once we start changing our fundamental moral and uh, psychological natures, then uh, a lot of things open up. Matthew? 
Yeah, thank you very much. I'm sort of going to piggyback a little bit on the two questions that I think were addressed to James, because I want to talk about sustainability and the environment. And I think this is a topic that many Gen Z really resonate with. Uh, it's something that we're increasingly recognizing as an intimate part of what it is to be a human being, because we're ensconced within an ecosystem. So we are relational creatures, and we are only as good as what is outside us and what we are interacting with. And I think that is a really powerful theme that not only captures Thank you. That not only captures the imagination of Gen Z, but it should capture the imagination of all of us because it's something that really is uh, looking increasingly difficult and there's something, a real challenge for us all to the point that, to go back to my goddaughter, you know, when she sees something about some uh, future event, uh, environmental event, she gets visibly distressed because she knows that this will be the world where she will be in the middle of challengings uh, where she will have to deal with them. So that's something that I think is really important to, to appreciate how sustainability and environmental issues are really, um, you know, very, very increasingly important when we're thinking about something like human flourishing. And I think within transhumanism, we can have this, I mean, with the clue should be in the name, trans and the humanism, there is this kind of interaction, relational kind of dimension to it, this beyondness. Um, but of course, there is within the community some kind of emphasis on the human form, and that uh, also can, you know, uh, make us forget that we're so uh, connected and relational. Now, the second question to do with uh, to do with human nature. I think that's a it's a venerable uh, philosophical concept and. Everybody has a, an account of what human nature is, sort of inchoately. But I think once we, there is a sort of danger of relying too much on those terms, because those terms can seem very cold, unfriendly, loaded with very uh, non-inclusive language, can sound like that to some listeners at least. Uh, and actually talking about well-being, talking about the good life, talking about things which people can really relate to, particularly young people, which is one of the reasons why I'm very interested in online celebrity, because um, now young people, if you ask them what the good life is, you ask them what human nature is, what's a fully flourishing life, they will all draw a blank. I mean, many of us in this room will be able to give some fairly you know, a comprehensive account of what a good life looks like, connected up to some of the themes to do with transhumanism. You ask the person on the street, they haven't got a, you know, a working account of that. You ask them who your favorite celebrity is and who they would like to live like if they could choose to live a life that they feel would be a, a fully human and empowered and uh, fully flourishing life, they will immediately come up with half a dozen examples. Uh, and that's a really powerful way of getting involved and getting people to think about the questions of what human nature is and what it's like when it's doing well or what it's like when it's being perfected. So there are often language things to do with how we approach these topics through the concepts that we use, which I think human nature will always be a part of this debate, but there are all other ways to approach this which can also be useful. So I just urge us all to really think about those ways too. Uh, there were two really quick questions, uh, one to uh, uh, Sandrine and uh, one to, to, to James. Um, uh, to Sandrine is uh, quite clear. Uh, can you tell us, uh, from the, the times you are involved in, uh, uh, what the evolution you, you saw? Other things are worse than worst, or are they better, or is it uh, stable? And to James, the question is, the question which was uh, uh, asked yesterday, um, uh, what uh, do you answer, your, uh, what your first answer uh, to the, 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 the question, the, the classical question? Uh, will it be only for the rich? And not, but not be the answer we had uh, yesterday, you know, the smartphone example, uh, etc. a political answer. Hands. All right, did he? If you. Yeah, so um, when I was uh, very young and uh, very left wing, uh, about 45 years ago, and not transhumanist. Uh, um, I was uh, already fascinated by uh, uh, technological progress and one of my ideas, but it was shared by many uh, people on the left side and even on the right side of the political spectrum was uh, let's use uh, uh, technological progress to uh, make uh, us, to make it possible to work less, you know, and even, yeah, it was not, not yet the idea not to work at all, or even maybe for some. Okay, and so uh, 45 years uh, later, I'm still left-wing, I'm not uh, young anymore, and I'm transhumanist, and I 
really do not understand how it is possible that so many people, uh, especially I would say on the left side of the political spectrum, uh, think that the goal of uh, AI is to work more, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, uh, I, I cannot understand that. I really cannot understand that. And, uh, uh, yeah, even on the, yeah, for example, in my country, Belgium, uh, even uh, uh, the uh, very left wing uh, political parties, yeah, they, they have the goal to uh, diminish. Uh, 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 the, the, the working time, but after that they have, they ask, oh yes, we should use AI to create new jobs and so on and so on. So, like, so why is this the, uh, this crazy uh, situation, James? So I'll let all three of you have a go at these questions. Are things getting better or worse? Is this really only for the rich? Are we deluding ourselves when we point to the example of the smartphone? And why aren't people working less? Why don't more political movements have the goal to work less? So I, I want to add one sentence. Well, one sentence. Yeah. For me, I don't understand why, but one part of the uh, answer is that of one part of the situation is we, in place of creating uh, an easier to live world, we create a bureaucratic, bureaucratic world with more and more tasks. OK. Thanks, Sandrine. Uh, currently, we have some few, few <laughs> improvements. Uh, for example, uh, in France, we don't see uh, policy, don't see community. But now, I make them uh, pay, for example, from black community media uh, to do the awareness in the egg donor and the sperm donor, also uh, from the embryonic uh, stem cells in the research. How we can help people have a sickle cells anemia? They can. Uh, also want to have a child. Uh, also, I, f I fight. Uh, we, st we keep on the on the law uh, the pre, pre, pre and premature testing genetic for the black person because we want to remove and say that we do the next generation screening that people don't don't uh, take these tools. I say because we don't uh, um, do our media don't speak for the black person because it's really uh, in the real advantage for the black person. We keep it on the law. So that is the few uh, I can say improvements. But we I think it takes time to change the society because people are used to work in the way we need to say that we need to change the way you work. But uh, I'm also an optimist person, so we need to fight, it continues to fight. I think it's going to be better, but with the politics now, it's fine. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure anymore, but I'm still op optimist. On the um, <coughs> egalitarian distribution question, I mean, I think in healthcare, it's relatively obvious. There should be universal healthcare programs that um, include a generous uh, set of technologies, and we would hope eventually some enhancement technologies. I had proposed in Citizen Cyborg a long time ago that um, you could use the risk benefit calculations that are used by most health, most health systems about whether to include a technology, and that it would actually uh, warrant including enhancement technologies that would have low risk and high benefits for society. Anti aging being a primary example would reduce the incidence of disease and so forth. Of course, you have to have a universal healthcare system first before you do that, and so that's the prior task in the United States is to create a universal healthcare system, then to reform the system so that it thinks about technology in this uh, in a way that's open to enhancement. Universal basic income is a sim similar set of issues. Um, you could imagine a future with a universal, you know, if you took all of the redistribution programs in the United States right now and put them into a UBI, it'd be about $4,000 a person per year. So that's not enough to live on. Um, a truly, um, you know, income, uh, poverty in level uh, income for UBI in the United States would require substantial redistribution. So um, when you start talking about that, then a lot of people's eyes roll up in their head. They're not interested anymore, right? You mean more taxation? Yeah, more taxation, because there's a lot of wealth in our society, a lot of inequality. Um, so I do think we have to confront these issues head on. And people's impression that we're elite, the more that we kind of evade them or are vague about these things, the more people have the impression that we're an elitist movement that's just trying to sell smoke and you know pie in the sky and ignore the tangible problems of inequality in our society. In terms of uh, post-work, I think there's an interesting kind of parallel between the way that people think about 
about um, anti-aging and the way that they think about post-work. And they, they look at people who are 80 years old, they say, well, hell, I don't want to be like that. They got you know, 12 different diseases, they're tw taking 12 different drugs a day. Um, but no, that's not what we want. We want there to be a, a post-aging society in which people are healthy for a very long time, right? And similarly with post-work, um, most people you know, in our society today, if you are especially a man who becomes unemployed, um, you are less you know, healthy, you're, you're going to have more depression, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because our society expects you to be a working person, right? But the kind of society we want to create is one where we reduce gradually in a transitional program the amount of work that everyone has to do and increase the public supports that allow them to live lives of leisure. And the person that I think has addressed this most um, insightfully was actually back in the 80s by Andre Gortz, a French um, uh, thinker. And he talked about what a transitional program towards a post-work society might be, where we redistribute essential work, which we all started to think about during COVID, what is the essential work and why do only some people do it and not others. Um, and uh, have public workshops, um, like a kind of a Home Depot for, you know, publicly supported Home Depot, where you could go and repair your, your technologies or build stuff. Um, and I, th I think there's experiments with these kinds of things in Europe already. So um, I do think it's, it's very important for us to imagine um, a, a wellness-oriented, a flourishing-oriented future, right? Because that's what people want. When people think about post-work or post-aging, they don't want it to be a depressing you know, uh, future. They want it to be one in which they're flourishing. So we have to depict, we have to imagine what it would require. I taught happiness, by the way, uh, the public policy of happiness for 10 years. And by the end, I was only interested in talking about flourishing because, you know, just simply mood um, it doesn't really tell you, you know, like, if you look around the world at the people who are the happiest today, it doesn't tell you anything about what the good society is, you know, like Colombians and, you know, uh, different societies that we wouldn't want to take public policy less lessons from necessarily. So really flourishing is the sense that your life is going in the right direction, right? And um, so I definitely agree that that should be our focus. Yeah, thank you very much. I just want to respond to that a little bit. So absolutely, flourishing is a much deeper sort of concept than subjective well-being or just what people are feeling, their emotions. Uh, but you might be thinking, you know, where does a philosopher go to find the resources to articulate something which is a little bit more, which is more diverse and more inclusive? Well, actually, I think many of these diverse uh, inputs have happened within our, within my discipline at least, in a very short space of time within the last decade where intercultural philosophy is becoming increasingly important looking at cultures which have a venerable philosophical traditions but have been largely ignored by the western tradition and actually within these cultures you often have much more of an emphasis on uh, either looking back into where we come from as a human society and where we're going um, so that's often couched in terms of the ancestors venerating the ancestors in various different indigenous philosophies Philosophies. But then in Confucianism and Buddhism, there's much more of a forward prospective kind of angle. And I think we've got a lot to learn from that, which really feeds again into the environmental flavors that I mentioned uh, earlier in the talk, uh, looking at how in, we are so ecologically connected to other elements within our environment, and we neglect those elements at our peril. Thanks. Thanks. So we started this session late, so I'm going to have one more short round of questions. If you're thinking of asking two questions, you should only pick one. By the way, uh, if you're leaving in the afternoon, I hope you don't leave, but if you do have to leave, please uh, put your plastic badge back on the table or in the bag so we can use it again. And also bear in mind we have a fascinating chance this afternoon to deeper dive. And also after lunch we have a performance by Zeta Smith, the poet. So that's something to look forward to. So who's got the most burning questions? Anton. Uh, yes, the question is uh, to Sandrian. Are you a member of a Senado or do you collaborate with them? A Senado. A Senado. A Senado. It's the DAO that does with uh, reproductive health and uh, rejuvenation for no. reproductive system. Okay, no. We are um, part of the issue. The Open Society Human Reproduction. So, what was in Milan in 2021 to speak about the issue of the black person. So, also in the some 
the field group uh, for the politics about uh, how can uh, change a policy in the law uh, to benefit for the black person. So that's, it's, it's a lot of work you can imagine to change all the policy and the laws in huge world because people used to work in a certain way. We need to change that to include in the diverse, to include the black and minority. Not also the black, we have the South Asian, but me, I'm speaking in the diversity where I know as a black, but you have the same government for the Asian in the in Europe also. So it's a huge work to change the policy in the law. So Sandrine, you can explore more about Athena Dow afterwards. Okay. My question for the three of you is, Matthew said we need to consider rebranding. So are you all keen to go out to the world with a big banner saying transhumanism, or do you think we need to approach the world differently? Well, you can guess my answer. I, I, I think we need to be a little bit more specific about where we're coming from if we want to um, convince people that we're not who they might think we are, and also because we just don't have enough of an agenda. If you, you know, if you don't, if you can't agree about something like should there be a food and drug administration, then you probably don't have a very strong political movement, right? <laughs> so you have to at least have the the groups agreeing about those basic issues. So I do, I do think that um, something like techno progressivism would eventually have more legs than just transhumanism. It would be like um, you're saying you're a consequentialist versus you know a liberal democrat. Liberal democrat has more content to it than a consequentialist. Yeah, thank you. So uh, you're absolutely right. You can guess my answer. I do think we need to engage in a kind of interrogative uh, process of questioning which terminology, which co key concepts are going to articulate the movement. I do like techno-progressivism and techno-optimism, I think, is another sort of term which is, you know, banded around slightly different. Um, but I think often it can be a very political task just to get people on side. And that's a, a, a sort of a, a technique or, a, or something that's been really lost in today's very polarised. Uh, social media kind of environment, but to sort of persuade people can be uh, very helpful to actually getting people on board and trying to find some commonalities when I think generally particular social media technology helps accentuate the differences. And one final question here. Um, I wanted to come back to the question why we haven't reduced working hours. So I think the clear answer is because of course capital doesn't want us to work less. So. Um, it's, uh, there's, it's, the, it's the obvious uh, antagonism inside of capitalism that capital wants low wages and high working hours and we want, or at least those of us who are not employers, want mostly high wages and low working hours. And um, well, the question is, um, could we make an analogy, for example, to longevity? Because mostly people after the retirement, they don't work, so capital also really doesn't have an incentive to keep them around. And if that would be so, do you think the workers' movement might be a vehicle to further transhumanist ideas? I think the workers' movement will be grappling with the threats of automation in very interesting ways. We already see it in many different cases. Your comment about the why we haven't seen a reduction in working hours, we have seen a reduction in working hours since the 19th century. You know, The number of hours spent per year per worker in the labor force has been declining. But um, in terms of still having a 40-hour work week and not the 30-hour work week that uh, Galbraith thought that we would have you know, back in the 30s, um, or, or even less, um, there is a movement, by the way, for a 32-hour work week, a 40-hour work, um, work week, and I think that's very exciting. So hopefully the labor movement will get on top of that. Um, but the answer that Andre Gortz gave, I think, is still probably my favorite answer, which is that we've commodified leisure. That um, because we, you know, decided that you had to have a certain amount of money to enjoy leisure, then you had to have work a certain number of hours to get that money, and so there was just this, you know, self-fulfilling cycle. Now it, that's just moralism. If you say, oh, you shouldn't be pursuing commodified leisure, why do you spend your money on video games instead of, you know, meditating or something? That's just moralism. So I don't know where to go with that, but I think we're, the answer is going to come from the technology. Technology is going to reduce the number of hours. Hours needed from humans, and 
and the, the capacity of capitalism to keep exploiting us is not a, a, infinite. We saw during COVID, when there were income supports, there was very naked debates about this. You know, it's like, if we keep these income supports, people aren't gonna go back to work. And right as soon as we had COVID uh, more or less over, there was the great resignation of people found a liberty to find better employment or not to uh, stay in the labor market at all. We had a lot of people who left the labor market permanently after COVID once they realized that they could. So um, I, yeah, I think capitalism is the reason, but uh, technology would probably be the answer. Final comments, Matthew, Sandrine? Okay, maybe I can answer to the question. I sweet with my job, <laughs> job. But it depends, uh, for me, if you, how you can reduce the number of the work. Uh, the thing is to talk about the technology, but uh, the, the problem, like we can give the technology to the people, is they didn't know how to use it, you lose the, so lose the time. So you have to explain and also work more. <laughs> so I don't think uh, the technology can solve everything, but also we, we sometimes miss the education. Educate people about the tools, what is very important is tools. When you educate people, when you explain them very well, they follow you all the time. But I think sometimes uh, we sometimes miss that technology will solve everything. I don't think so. So just forget about the education and the people, how to use the tools. <laughs> technology plus human transformation. Yeah, so thank you. I think, um, yeah, for me, I think the, the problem of the 21st century, or at least at the beginning of it, has been balkanization, this splitting, this fracturing of people who would otherwise uh, agree with one another and also their common interest would be shared by bonding and connecting with one another. I think that's good. Ex the example you raise is a good example of that. There are lots of commonalities, lots of common interests and it's a way, it's often a, a particular skill set to show what those common interests are. When you ask people about what their notion of the flourishing looks like, even if you ask cross-culturally, you find enormous numbers of commonalities and similarities between those, between those things. Of course some important differences too, but largely people are very very similar in what they think the good life is thanks so we've finished this session now i'll ask you in a minute to thank the speakers i want to say a couple of things first of all our dinner tonight there is an option to have dinner tonight and heels has been very generous heels unexpectedly has said they're going to cover the cost of dinner for everybody who comes no at noon Oh, the, I'm sorry, the lunch, the lunch is, <laughs> all right, there's a miscommunication, English and French there, <laughs> all right, all right, so forget about that, there's no free dinner tonight, if you go to dinner tonight, you have to pay for your own dinner, but if you do, if you do want to contribute, then speak to Didier about uh, the lunch. We are going to have now our conversation over lunch, and we're going to get back on schedule. So we will be starting with uh, performance by Zita Smith, back on what the program said. So I think that's at, was it half past? A uh, 2.30. 30 yes, so we'll be back there. So thanks very much to Matthew, James, and Sandrine. Great conversation. <laughs>